So we're going to now go to Zoe Blunt. She's from Canada and an eco-feminist warrior from the West Coast. Zoe's going to do a follow-up talk correcting misinformation about lesbian separatism and the law and explain the many different ways to create lesbian-only spaces and events. So welcome, Zoe. Over to you. I'm glad I have a chance to, to respond to, uh, to the situation in the U.S. and in the justice system. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that uh, there are, this is what, what I'm going to be talking about is a different realm, is a different uh, sphere, which is um, the social sphere. So outside of the correction system, outside of the government, outside of these official channels, we still have the whole social world. We have the, the spaces that we can create. So I'm going to talk about uh, how we can do that within the law. Um, uh, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I have had some experience. So I have a slightly different interpretation, uh, at least in Canada, of uh, how these self-ID laws are playing out and how, how we can use them in the future. And uh, I'm, we've been gathering you know, on the west coast of Canada, on Vancouver Island here and on the mainland for five years now. So we are the radical radical feminists of Canada previously West Coast Women, radfems.ca. And uh, we have uh, over 100 members now. Um, and it, it, is, it's a, it is a private group. And um, what, I wa what I want to talk about here is you know, about women's land and why it is legal and why it is desirable to create women-only spaces. What is the legal basis for that? Um, and women's land, as, as some of you may remember, uh, may already know, is uh, it, always existed uh, from the time of Sappho uh, to the present day um, and to the future too. It's going to, this is something that's going to be continuing. This is something that's actually growing, I think right now. So for thousands of years and including in, in societies all over the world from ancient Greece, from uh, indigenous societies here, there's always been women's spaces, you know, going back as far as we can. Um, and so the, in the future, you know, like I say, I think there is a coming wave. Uh, so this is, these are these are ways, you know, that we can create women only economic, emotional, spiritual independence from men and from male institutions. And so because women's spaces have always existed, whether it's in the form of a, a women only school or a convent, a religious retreat, um, it is it's it's common law. It is, and this is what we saw in the Maya Forstadter um, ruling recently. <clears throat> it referenced common law, and uh, this is the basis of the legal system in Canada, in the United States. Um, all these all these conflicts are going to be resolved eventually, I believe, or they'll they'll continue to be debated, but it's not settled yet. So common law, the way it plays out in Canada, for example in our constitution and our charter of rights, it says these rights are given to male and female persons, period. So they have not rewritten the charter here. They have not rewritten the constitution. You cannot rewrite common law. And that it is set in stone is, is my understanding. The human rights laws in Canada and uh, in, in the provinces are explicitly allow groups to be for a, a certain demographic that we can create organizations specifically for women and uh, that is that is allowed um, this is these are purely social groups and here's where in most cases the courts don't have jurisdiction over saying who you must associate with or who you do not wish to associate with we have freedom of association and that is that is the basis we also have freedom of association includes freedom from association. And so women only spaces are explicitly recognized by the human rights law and by the courts. Um, Vancouver Rape Relief was the, uh, the iconic case in Canada here in Vancouver. And they were uh, challenged to defend their policy of hiring only women born women. And they did prevail in that case. They established in, in courts in precedent, the right to have women-only spaces because they are serving women who have been raped and abused by men. And they, it was their belief 
that uh, women are the ones who are best suited to to help other women and that they didn't want to um, add to the trauma, add to the confusion of a woman who's already been victimized. And so this was, uh, this was based on human rights law, which is based in common law. As we've seen, the, these uh, women are, have not been exercising, we have not yet exercised the, the political will to establish more of these because we are under attack socially and politically. Um, but contrary to what Stonewall and, and others have said, what they want us to believe, you know, they tell us what they, they think the law should be, and we should not accept that. I do not accept it. And I don't, in, as a general rule, I don't accept bullshit laws that have not been tested in court as gender identity has not been tested in court. So I don't, I don't accept that. And these, uh, my interpretation is that these new laws in Canada, at least, do not take away from women's social rights, women's rights to autonomy, um, it adds gender identity, but sex is still a protected characteristic in the Human Rights Act, in human rights law. And again, it's the basis is the charter and the constitution. So I don't respect that. So, um, but I do want to speak more about, about women's land and what it's like and uh, how, these, how these collectives came to be. And um, so many of you may know that uh, in the in the 70s, especially in the 80s and 90s, there were hundreds of women's land collectives uh, founded in uh, Canada, in the United States, in Europe. Many of these places still exist and many of them are looking for new members. Some of them are up for sale. Some of them are struggling. Others have, have disintegrated. Um, but they, many of these were founded when the properties were raw land. So women purchased raw land and they did all the work themselves in most of these places that I've uh, looked into, um, building the houses from, with hand tools many of the times, with uh, uh, materials that were salvaged. Um, and uh, so many of these collectives are really very rough. There have been whatever women have been able to make for themselves. And 20 or 30 years on, you know, many of these places are very well established now. They have uh, uh, hot and cold running water and electricity and all these things that women have built for themselves. Some of them don't. Some of them, it's, it's very minimal. Um, but they're still in process. And so repairs, upgrades, expansions, this is all going on. And... Uh, Many of these places need workers to maintain, repair, and evolve the, the land and the facilities. They're all different, and usually they're small, five to 15 women. Some of them have a lot of rules, and some of them don't have enough rules, and some of them are, are very rough and crowded. Others are more relaxed. Yeah, these collectives uh, for the last 50 years, you know, there's many of them are farms, many of them are rural, many of them are very remote. And uh, in the next 50 years, I think, God is willing, we're going to see a, a renaissance. A, uh, women are coming back. This is an idea that has come full circle. And many of us are being pushed to this because of what's happening in the political sphere and with the government, with these, uh, these impositions on us. So we, we have to create women-only spaces. And uh, I don't think anybody can stop us from doing that. Um, I think it may be a battle in some cases, but I am talking about what we choose to do uh, privately, essentially. This is, um, we have moved to a, uh, a sort of a members only um, uh, way of uh, organizing. We are underground, but we have been meeting for five years. We've been holding gatherings for five years now. Women are coming back to this idea of uh, calling it uh, co-housing and other things like this, especially uh, women in cities now. So this has become more of an urban movement is what I'm seeing. Um, there is a, a group that was started in Toronto called Senior Ladies Living Together. And it it's now has you know, something like 50,000 members from all over the world. So the, the, the women, older women, especially single women, lesbians are moving in together out of partly out of economic necessity, partly out of the desire to create these spaces separate from men where we can be autonomous, where we are independent. And that is so necessary. It's such a great weight to take off of you. And, and we don't want to be alone. So I'm going to talk about the various ways that, that uh, women are doing this. Um, and I think it, it, of course, starts with the attitude. 
of uh, I don't believe it's impossible. If we convince ourselves it's it's impossible, then we won't do it, and that we we get a free pass. We're excused, but it's not impossible. I don't accept that, and we are doing it, and women are doing it all the time. So the various ways that women are creating these these spaces for for housing, for living separately from men, uh, through co-housing, through um, um, the land collectives, through um, uh, housing co-ops, land trusts, and uh, I'm trying to read my notes here. Most of the collectives, most of the land collectives I know of, uh, were formed as a cooperative or as a nonprofit group with bylaws and the funds held in trust. Now I've created a nonprofit in Canada and uh, it, it is for women, it's for women only, it's for women born women, we define that. And we also have the citation from the Human Rights Act saying that it is not discrimination if we choose to serve the interests of one particular group and not others. Um, and we haven't been challenged on that, but that we are standing on that, you know, we're, it is based on that. Um, so so these, these uh, uh, land trusts and housing cooperatives and other forms of incorporation, that's in the documents, that's in your charter, and it's, uh, that's, that's the purpose of the organization. So there you go. And, um, and then we have a, a membership process, of course, to elect the board of directors to join the members and so on. And um, we also have a number of, uh, of women's land collectives or, or spaces that are owned by one or two women and uh, or, or two or three women and they're organized that way um, but those lack a mechanism for permanent women only lands and this is why we want to have a cooperative or a land trust or even just some kind of a co-housing agreement where it is it is written down and that is the purpose that it, it's women only permanently um, and uh, this allows us, of course, to pool our resources. We are stronger together and, and it provides a base. My vision is to have a base for workshops, a refuge for women, a mentorship for young women, get youth and elders together to pass on the knowledge that we have and to share our strength with each other. Um, so um, I have a long description here about um, uh, Spinster Vale, um, but uh, perhaps it'd be more, more useful to, to to discuss how women can get in touch with uh, women's land collectives. And like I said, there, there are, um, I have a directory. Um, many of the listings are out of date, um, but uh, there, there's contact information there for countries all over the world. If people decide that they want to uh, start a women's land collective, then you know they should be looking into creating a nonprofit, creating a co-op, creating a land trust, they should be re recruiting women uh, in order that they can uh, pool their resources. And, uh, and, and many women these days, of course, are, you know, rather than buying land, they are renting together. Um, they, are, um, they are just joining into a lease together and, uh, and sharing their resources that way. And that's a, that can be a stepping stone. It's so necessary right now for all the reasons that we, that we just heard about. There is absolute, you know, rock solid legal basis for us to have women only spaces that the courts don't have jurisdiction over uh, who we who we have to sleep with and essentially who we have to have in our homes, who we need to have in our spaces and that we we can create those spaces and we're doing it. Women are doing it all over the world. 